All right, if you would open up your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And I think this message will be appropriate to all of us, but also specifically to moms this morning, although not directed specifically to them by me nor the text. We are getting near the end of this wonderful book. We will finish next week. Um, And as I have looked at this book, both God does speak to us all through his word. Uh, But my question is, how will God speak to us today? And more importantly, how will God speak to you specifically today in this text? God has not drawn you here this morning to keep you busy and to keep you out of bad weather. Okay, God has drawn you here today to speak to you. The living God, the holy God, the creator of the universe has you in this place to speak to you specifically. So my question is, oh, how does God want to speak to you? How does God want to encourage your heart this morning? How does he want to strengthen you, to transform you? I believe the Spirit has things he wants to accomplish in all of us today and do that very specifically. I've been telling this morning's message, message, the hope of the humble heart. The hope of the humble heart. And the main point is this, humility invites God's grace and finds its strength in God's care. Humility invites the grace of God into our life. It invites God's grace. But we don't just become humble people. We find our strength to be humble in God's sovereign, providential, mighty care over our lives. Humility invites God's grace and finds its strength in God's grace. So we're going to read three verses this morning. And as I was preparing, I told my wife this morning, I said, I think I have three messages. In these three verses. That's how much is in this very brief section. But we'll limit it to one today. Just to alleviate any nervousness that I just created. (laughs) Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word. It's living, it speaks, it's got power has promises, but Lord, if we don't have your Holy Spirit today, it will just be words. So Lord, I need your Spirit, the filling and anointing of your Spirit to preach your word, and Lord, all of our, my hearers need your Spirit to hear and apply and to be strengthened and encouraged by your word. So Spirit of God, help us. Bless this time. Speak to us. Prepare us for tomorrow and the next day and the next week, the next month, the next year, the next decade. God, be with us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is interesting that this text that has such a focus on humility, three times in three verses, humility is referenced, that it is written by Peter. If you stop and you know anything about Peter, Peter, one of the apostles, but before apostle, disciples of Christ. Peter would not be a guy that you would think of and and you wouldn't have as a probably a picture of humility as a disciple. I have a picture of boldness, rashness. Really what I have a picture with Peter is overconfidence. That Peter was a very confident man. I mean, I think Peter viewed himself, he certainly was a lead apostle, but I think he viewed himself that way as well. And actually it wasn't just Peter, it was all the disciples. Right, They all wanted to be great. So when James and John asked for a seat next to Jesus in his kingdom, you know, and his mom, the mom's behind there, the little league mom's pushing the son, sons, you know, let my boys be the stars uh, ahead. And so all that's happening. Well, the rest of the disciples are all offended. They're not offended at the arrogance of the request. They're offended that they wanted that request. They wanted that seat. And I'm sure Peter was the most angry. How dare James and John ask for what I deserve? 
Peter was strong. I don't know the humility marked him. It didn't seem to be a, necessarily his character straight, uh, trait. I, I think he was overconfident. Think about it this way. The night before Jesus is portrayed and crucified, he looks at Peter and says, you will deny me three times. Now, you might think, now, I've just watched Jesus raise people from the dead, walk on water, preach like anybody else. Maybe I shouldn't debate him. But Peter has no problem saying, Lord, you're wrong. I I will never. Now, all those other guys around here, they might. They might deny you. They might leave me. I'll never do that. Jesus comes back and says, oh, yes, you will. You might say, gee, now that's twice Jesus has told me something. Maybe I should take a back seat. Oh, no, not Peter. No, Lord. They might. I'll die for you. He is confident of who he is. He does not anticipate his great failure. Even though Jesus predicted his denials. Now, folks... We would all recognize this, right? Life can be humbling, can it? Life can be humbling. If you live long enough, it's going to be humbling. Okay? Life can be very humbling. But I want you to understand this. It wasn't life that humbled Peter. I don't ultimately think it's life that humbles us. It was the grace and mercy of God that humbled Peter. It wasn't failure alone that humbled Peter. It was how God interacted with that failure. I think it was the mercy of God that became so great for Peter that he didn't walk around saying, oh my, I can't believe, you know, here I am, you know, the, the lead disciple, the lead apostle, and look how I failed so drastically. It was, oh, look how God treated me in the midst of that failure. Look at the mercy of God. I think it was the mercy of God and the grace of God that humbled Peter, not just life. And I believe the same can be true for us. It's not just life, failures, and weakness that humble us, but it's as we stand before God and we say, and my, how my Savior treats me. Why would this great God die for me? So it's not just our self-assessment, it's an assessment of his grace, his glory, his majesty, and his mercy. Folks, we're going to look at humility today, because this text focuses on that. And I want us to look at it in the way that we can look at a diamond. You know, if you ever have shopped for a diamond, I've only done it once in my life. Shopping for a diamond, they always would put it on the black backdrop And then they sort of turn it for you so it just catches your eye. It sparkles and the facets of the diamond, they catch your eye. Well, folks, I want us to look at humility because it's a precious character trait. It's a precious jewel in the Christian life. So first, three points this morning. First, the call to humility. The call to humility. Look at verse 5. In through the beginning of verse 6. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the, uh, to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then in the beginning of verse 6, we have it yet again. Humble your, th- yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Three calls in these first verse and a half uh, regarding humility. And please understand this. Humility is a pervasive call throughout all of Scripture. I have no lack for verses that I could bring to you about the importance and priority of humility, not just for Christians, but for all of God's people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So listen to what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 66, verse 2. Here's the Lord speaking to him. But this is the one to whom I will look. Whom does God look? And please understand, that looking is favor. That looking is affection. So whom is the one whom God looks? He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. In Micah 6.8, same thing. He has told you, a man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? 
What does God require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? If we move to the New Testament, we hear Jesus teaching in Luke 14, verse 11 says this, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then James, in James 4.10, says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This call to humility should mark us. The church really should be the gathering of the humble. The gathering of the humble. It is a pervasive call throughout all of Scripture. But I want you to understand in this text, it's also not on a call. It is a personal responsibility. Look what it says in verse 5. Likewise, you are younger, be subject to the elders. Now look at this, second half of verse 5. Clothe yourselves. In other words, this is something you do. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. And then in verse 6, it tells us this, humble yourselves. So we're not passive in humility. We're active. You take steps to be this way. You don't just sit there saying, well, God, just make me humble. God, when will I become humble? No, you actually take actions to humble yourself. Humility is thinking lowly. It's thinking of others more importantly than yourself. It's active. Now, here's a, there's a great example in Scripture, um, actually, for Israel and for the king of Israel. Think about kings. Kings aren't not generally known for humility, right? They're known for boldness, decisiveness, leadership. But in 2 Chronicles, maybe not a typical place you go, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there's a great story. And it's about King Jehoshaphat. And what happens in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, three nations, actually nations that God had somewhat spared, told them not to wipe out. Three nations have been spared by God, but these three nations now are gathering together and they're going to attack his, they're going to attack Judah. Three nations ganging up to attack Judah. And Jehoshaphat is taken aback by this. So, So just Listen to him. He goes, there's people told you how a great multitude is coming against you. Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. And he proclaims a fast throughout all of Judah. I mean, not only is he afraid, he's basically letting his fear go public. We are about to be attacked by three nations. And then he says this in verse 12, and this I do have for you. Oh, our God. Will you not execute judgment on them? Now look at the humility in this next verse, this next phrase. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you trying to think how that makes it into a leadership book today. Leadership 101, we don't know what to do. We're afraid. We don't know what to do. Right? Leadership is knowing what to do generally. It's figuring out a plan. It's having a strategy. Well, here's the king of Judah saying, I don't know what to do, but this is what I will do. I'll look to you. And boy, go back and read the story. Read 2 Chronicles 20 and see God. The same God that we love and serve, see that God because you know what? They are delivered. They never even have to fight. God confounds their enemies and they kill one another. And Israel spends three days plundering them. There's so much they get. It's like, we don't have, I gotta gotta go empty my pockets out. I got so much in them. I can't carry more plunder. They don't have to even fight. There's their strategy. We look to the Lord. You know what that's declaring? We're dependent, not independent. We need God to solve our problems. We can't solve them ourselves. We can't fix it ourselves. 
I need God to come in and do something I can't do. And you know what? Sometimes we have to say this. I don't even know what to do. That's what he said. We do not know what to do. And there's times we don't know what to do. You're parenting, you don't know what to do. You're in a relationship, you don't know what to do. Something at work, you don't know what to do. You just don't know what to do. Well, look to God. Our eyes are on you. We are dependent creatures, not independent creatures. So that is the call to humility. Secondly, the motive for humility. And there are three motives in these few verses for humility. Look, you'll, you'll see them. What? what what's, a, what's a motive for humility? Well, one, in verse 5, look at it right there. God opposes the proud. That should be a motive. In fact, that could be the last motive. Right? What do you need more than this? That God is opposing me. Okay? God opposes the proud. He finds pride and arrogance offensive. It is personally offensive to him. So God opposes the proud. He opposes those that are self-satisfied, self-reliant, and self-exalting. He's opposing those that believe their press clippings. That I'm all that. You know what they say? Yeah, well, it's embarrassing to say, but it's true. No, no, he's opposing that. He's opposing that you think you can clean up your own act. He's opposing that, that you can be self-sufficient, that you can make it work, that you, can have, you have all the resources you need. To, to, you don't need God. That's, he's in opposition to that. Because God opposes the proud. And I think John Stott captures this very well when he says the following. Pride is itself the essence of all sin. For it is the stubborn refusal to let God be God with the corresponding ambition to take his place. It is the attempt to dethrone God and enthrone ourselves. God hears how the universe should run and you will be accountable to me. You will answer to me for what I think should happen. And actually, if I were in charge, I could do a better job. Oh, do you understand why God opposes the proud? You read throughout Scripture the opposition of God to the proud. proud. When Nebuchadnezzar stands over Babylon, right? One One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Great king, the Babylonian Empire, and he just looks over that empire and over that city and says, Look what I have done. And God, yeah, and you're going to lose it today. And you're going to be crazy and you're going to act like an animal and you're going to be out of your kingdom for seven years. God opposes the proud. Satan's sin certainly was pride. Certainly appealed to pride in the garden. You can be God without him. What gives God the right to tell right and wrong? Just and unjust. You be the arbitrator. God opposes the proud. That should be a motive for humility. It's a negative motive. There's more. Here's a better motive. God gives grace to the humble. So God opposes the proud, but, but, He gives grace to the humble. And here grace would be more than just favor, unmerited favor. There is power in this. He gives. This gets God's attention. This fulfills what it says in Isaiah 66 too. This is the one whom I will look. I look to that person who is humble. And there's something when I'm looking, there's action to that. There's power to that. So God gives grace to the humble. That is a motive for humility. And then there's another motive in the text as well. Look at verse 6. Oh, humble yourselves. There's the call. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, here is now a motive coming. So at the proper time, he may exalt you. So at the proper time, 
he may exalt you. And if you notice what's said in verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God. When you talk about the mighty hand of God, you know what that functions for Peter and anybody that would have understand Old Testament context? The mighty hand of God is the God who delivered them from Egypt. That's God Almighty. That's the Lord of hosts. That's the Lord who can call angels down and wipe out everything. This God Almighty, that's the one who will exalt you in due time, at the proper time. Now, because of the context of the book, when do you think that proper time is? Mostly, usually, ultimately, I think it's eternity. It's heaven. See, if it's not that, how's that text help slaves in this context? Were they going to be vindicated and exalted in their day? No, they lived as a slave and they were going to die as a slave. The poor started poor, ended poor. Those that received injustice continue sometimes to receive injustice. But there is a day coming when God will exalt. God will exalt those that trust him even in betrayal. God will exalt. God is a just God. Here's our problem. Justice is delayed. We wait. And the wait's a challenge. It is a challenge for us to wait. I'm sure it's always been a challenge to wait for the justice of God. When will that time of exalting? He says, oh, he will exalt you at the proper time. Sometimes vindication happens here. Typically, I don't think so. And it didn't happen for these folks. That's not what happened. There is a day that will come. Folks, we, if you remember, we studied Ecclesiastes. And it was the, it was the, the, the idea that we don't get justice here on earth. And, and the writer of Ecclesiastes is frustrated with that. He's wrestling with that because he knows something. God's just. And yet injustice seems to win the day often here on earth. Why? And it's a real question. And by the way, those real questions must be asked and we must wrestle with them. There's not always easy answers for those questions. But here's the promise. These are the motives for humility. God, you do not want to invite the opposition of God Almighty who laughs at your plans and schemes. If he laughs at the kings of the world, if he laughed at Nebuchadnezzar, absolute power, done. He laughs at Pharaoh, done. He raises up kings and takes them down. You do not want that God opposing you. That's a motive. And then, oh, and this great God that has all that power, oh, he gives grace to the humble. And the final thing, God will exalt. May we trust him in the delay. Third point, third facet. So we see the call to humility. See the preciousness of it. We see the motive for humility. And third, the expression of humility. And again, Multiple expressions. Multiple. We could, we could sit, really, folks, in this text and say, man, I, I'd like to unpack. And I'm not unpacking everything. So how do you humble yourself? Didn't unpack that fully. Right? What else? What, there's just a lot you can do here. So here, here we're going to look at how the humility be, is expressed in this text. By the way, there could be other expressions of humility. One, be subject Look at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. I think that's f- fingernails on a chalkboard. Oh, that just sounds, particularly if you're under 30. If you're over 30, you're like, you got that right. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm expecting older people like, preach it, brother. We need to get a little charismatic on this thing. Like, let's, let's go. Amen. Younger people are saying, stop that man. To the elders, there's something being said here. 
And I think what it's recognizing is, you know what, there's a challenge probably, isn't there, between people who are older and people that are younger. In the 60s, because I taught history, I taught a whole class just on the 60s. 60s was a very unique time in American history. You have Civil War, you have the Civil Rights Movement, and you have a completely moral, moral redefinition and moral chaos. You have entertainment, and now entertainers are leading the way for social commentary uh, through rock musicians and all that. So it's, a, it's just a dramatic time. One of the things that, took, that was taking place in the 60s is what they called the generation gap. The generation gap. So it was things like this. You can't trust anybody over 30. That was a common refrain in the 60s. You can't trust anybody over 30. And you know what else was a common refrain? Question authority. They were common refrains in the 60s. Question authority, and you can't trust anybody under 30. Over 30. Folks, the generation gap has always existed. It's not new to America. It's not new to our day today. It's always existed because it existed biblically. Why do you think it exists? Well, I think there's a few things that are about what well, that gets into this, and then we'll get back to be subject. Think about young people. What are they known for? Zeal, right? So you have the zeal of the young and the wisdom of the old. They can stand in conflict with one another. You have the innovation of young people. Let's do something new. And you have, let's keep it the way it was. Let's protect what we have of old people. Okay? So you get into these things of young people, want, let's do something different. Let's change. Are we paying attention? Let's do something. Let's do something significant. This is one of the good things of the millennial generation. Let's make a difference. Let's make a difference. We're not going to buy in some of the other things. Let's make a difference. But it's always been the zeal of the young. Let's make a difference. Let's think purely and 100% consistently and, and ideologically about life. That's a good thing. And let's, let's not get stuck in old ways. Can we do something new? There's many a pastor who's walked into many a church who said, let's bring change to walk away pretty wounded. I know a lot of pastors, my brother being one of them, churches saying, we want, God, we want a guy to come in. We need new leadership and new vision for our church. He would come in and bring leadership and vision. It was like, well, whoa, I didn't know that leadership and vision was going to touch what I'm doing. So no longer do I want your leadership and vision. I want you to make everything great, but keep me great in my place and not change anything. Except all the things that I, by the way, is critical of in the church. Change those things, but not my thing. So older people can be, let's protect Slow down. Slow down. You know, people are going to speed up. What are we waiting for? How long is the decision going to be made? These should be strengths that complement, not strengths that compete. I think older people, we need to be listening carefully to the zeal, idealism, innovation, energy of the young. And younger people, you need to be listening to the wisdom and patience of the old. Will we do this together well, church? Do we see our need for one another? We must. And by the way, if I were to emphasize responsibility, I'd probably emphasize somewhat to the elders. Now, these elders here are not just old. These are, I think, the elders of the church because the elders is what precedes it in verses 1 through 4. But what do you, what's an expression of humility? Subject. Be subject. So young people, how can that function and will that function? I think there's specific application to young people subject to the elders of the church, the pastor of the church. But you can broaden that out. How do I think about the next gener the older generation? How do I think about my parents? How do I think about them? Do they have wisdom? Do I understand the strengths of that? And do I understand the limitations of that? And how does patience work with me? So we have to think about that. We're talking about this, by the way, very actively in Sovereign Grace. Because there's some pastors that are older, like me, and there's some guys that are younger, like my son, Jeff. 
Jeff's zeal and ambition and innovation and energy runs right into my patience, better wisdom. (laughs) We need to edit that out of the message in case he listens. How do those strengths serve one another? How do they complement one another? Otherwise, you know what? The old guard will just keep it the way it was because that's the way it always was and we're not changing it as long as I'm, my body's, you know, got any breath in it. As long as I'm done, we're holding on, you know. That's wrong. But younger people, patience, respect. They both need to function. So be subject to the elders. But you know what? There's a greater subjection. Be subject to God. Look at verse 6. Humble yourselves there where? Under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Which seems to me means we accept God's providence and rule. We don't chafe or resist. We don't. We don't chafe. We don't resist. We don't assume we know better. We don't do that. We actually say, no, I'll humble myself. I won't exalt my thinking. I won't do that. If you could create the universe, think you can handle this. This, is, this was, by the way, the ultimate answer of God to Job, and it was his ultimate satisfaction, hope, when Job's asking all his questions under suffering that most of us cannot relate to, questions around justice and right and fairness that he had every right to ask in a sense. And he was godly in his asking, unlike his wife who was saying, just curse God and die. Job's engaging. He's not supported by friends. So now in his suffering, he's mostly alone. He doesn't have his wife's support really, nor his friend's support. He is wrestling. How does God answer his questions? Oh, God comes and questions him. And what God does in those questions is reveal his greatness and his sovereignty. And and all of a sudden, Job's gotten a whole different picture. God never tells him the part we know. The part we know is Satan was saying, you know why Job loves you, God? Because you bless him. And that's the only reason Job loves you. Because you are are just Santa Claus. And you just give this guy everything he wants. So you protect him, you prosper him, you bless him. See what happens if you take it away. Because he doesn't love you, he loves your stuff. That's what Job loves. He loves blessing, not the blesser. Job's not aware of this heavenly conversation. God's sovereign. God does allow it to happen. And he he tells Satan, right, you can go this far and not one step farther. And Satan keeps coming back, okay, you did that. But I still don't think Job really loves you for you. He doesn't love you because you're worthy. He still loves you for stuff. So let me touch this. Let me touch that. Let me touch this. Oh, does Job struggle? Yeah. Does he ask real questions? Oh, yeah. Lose your fortune, lose your family, lose your health. Don't get the support of a wife, good counsel, or your friends. And then God reveals himself. And Job is restored. And yes, the story ends with a happy ending for Job. He receives twice as much prosperity. But you know what? He still had the loss of his kids. That it seems like he had a real strong relationship with. They ate together a lot. But he was a redefined man. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Except don't chafe, don't resent, don't assert, don't be proud. And what's the promise again? Because at the proper time, he will exalt you. So, an expression of Submission of humility, excuse me, be subject to the elders and to God. But it doesn't stop there. 
and so that nobody thinks this is a rigged game, we're also to be, to be humble in all relationships. Look at, look again at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Oh, that's specific. But then don't miss the next sentence. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, which is why older people need to be humble to younger people. It is, who am I to be humble with and to? Well, actually, each one of you. Each one of you. There would be, should be expression and belief, conviction about humility. I love how Paul writes about this in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul says this, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility. Now, here's what it starts to look like. Count others as more, as more significant than yourselves. Ah, more important than me. There's someone else that actually not just has value, but I view them as more valuable. And then each of you, let each of you look not only to, your, to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's what humility looks like. I consider others more important, and I look to their interests. So, we are subject to the elders are subject to God. We are humble to one another. All relationships should be marked by humility, which is why the church should be the gathering of the humble. And then lastly, and this is where we're going to end and also bring focus to, because I love verse 7. Casting, here's an expression of humility. This is another expression of humility. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Brothers and sisters, God is not indifferent to your life. God does not sit back distantly and say, they're just silly problems. When are they going to get a grip? God is not indifferent to your life. Whether it's big suffering or small suffering. Big concerns, small concerns. He's not indifferent to your life. He cares for you. He knows you by name. He sees you. Listen to these verses if you are anxious today. Because it says, casting all your anxieties on him. Cast them. They don't rest on you anymore. Cast them. If you're anxious today, listen to these verses. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. He and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. I love this one. Psalm 56, 8. You have kept my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Ever feel like you've cried alone? Your tears are in his bottle. So it's not only he wipe away every tear, Wipe away every tear, every tear precious. Your tears. It doesn't say the absence of tears, that you'll never have tears. It says your tears be kept in his bottle. Isaiah 49. Think of this picture. Can a woman forget her nursing child? How would you answer that on Mother's Day? No. A mother would never forget her nursing child. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? You know what? Even these may forget. Right? It's almost saying the impossible. But God's more. Yet I will not forget you. 
Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. To be engraved on the palms of those hands? You'll see the nail prints for you. You'll see them for you. God cares. He's not indifferent. Now what he does that we can't see, God sees a thousand connections in our lives that we don't see. So we don't always sense that. Because in our minds, if he loved me, we finish the sentence. But God sees a thousand connections we can't see. Think about this way. On a Mother's Day, how many of our of things we do for our children and they don't see the connections? Do young children see connections? They don't. They see what they want, and they don't understand why they're not getting it. And it seems unfair, unkind, cruel. <laughs> One of my grandchildren the other night, we have a box of snacks. We have more stuff for our grandchildren than we ever had for our kids. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, probably love our grandchildren more. Um, <laughs> let's pull it back in. But one of our grandchildren... So Kim has me mom's big box of snacks. There are things of Pringles in there and other snacks. Like we would, kids, you have one bag, you make it last a week, and you split a potato chip. And be thankful. <laughs> They're having individual expensive snacks. My food budget's higher. I have less people in the home. And, and they're there. And one of my grandchildren is weeping. And does not want a snack. Why? Because the box is a different box than it used to be. <laughs> it's not the original box. Well, the box got wrecked. I don't care. I don't want your snack. <laughs> That's you and me. That's you and me. We think we have enough wisdom to interpret life. There's a thousand connections that God makes and sees that we don't. But we're like that little one that hasn't put it all together. You would have thought we ruined his world last night. Can't believe my grandparents. I mean, if he could blog right now, he'd be blogging. What to do when you're unloved by your grandparents? <laughs> you know? And you know what else? All the other little kids, like, 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 they'd all be liking it. <laughs> do you hear? What's our heart to our children? We love them. And by the way, we're imperfect parents. We really do make mistakes. We're not always loving. We can be provoked. God's not like that. But he does see the thousand connections we don't see. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. And for some of you, I trust it will speak to you right now. In this very moment. Some of you are perplexed with a multitude of anxieties about your life. You do not know what to do. You are bewildered, and you cannot see Providence's clue or Providence's hand. You are lost in a maze. Indeed, at this moment, you are depressed. My perplexed friend 
And my perplexed friends, remember your way is ordered by a higher power than your will and your choice. The eternal God has fixed your every step. He who loved you from before the foundations of the world has immutably determined every step of our pilgrimage. Elect exile, elect exile every step of our pilgrimage. It is a blessed thing after you have been muddling and meddling with your anxieties to throw your burdens in the Lord and leave them there. This word casting, this verb, only is one other time in the New Testament. The theme is all over the Bible, but only one other time, this, this actual verb, and it's, it's in Luke. It's when they cast their cloaks on the donkey when Jesus entered into, the, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You cast it on. In other words, you're not carrying it any weight anymore. You're not meant to carry it. Cast your burdens in the Lord. Why? Cast your cares in the Lord because he cares for you. How do we cast our cares in the Lord? And here's where I'm going to close and we're going to sing in just a moment. Here's how you cast your cares. Here's how you can actively be humble. Do not be anxious about anything. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, the thousand connections you don't see, it surpasses understanding the questions that are unanswered. Those why questions that are unanswered. And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May we, in humility, submit ourselves before the mighty hand of God, trusting that he will exalt us in good time. And may we cast our cares on him because this God cares for you every tear. And he will exalt you at the proper time. If I could have the worship team join me, let's stand as I pray. Lord God, we all arrive at this place. in personally different places. Some just rejoicing. Some in sorrow. Some with no cares right now. Some with deep anxieties. Some with unmitigated joy. Others with perplexing, clinging depression. You are the God over all. Lord, you care about each one of us. Lord, may we humbly bend before you. May we humbly trust you. May we cast our cares upon you. Because you so care for us. Lord, so much so that we could be engraven on your hands. Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for us. To demonstrate your love for us, your care for our most desperate concern. Which is the horror, guilt, and shame of our sin. And yet you have taken it all upon yourself that we could walk free. God, thank you for your wonderful grace. And Lord, we want to sing now of your grace, your care, and your character. And Lord, as we sing, may we just, for those that are burdened, may we just actively be casting cares. Lord, may you, may you take cares, take burdens from us, Lord. 
This morning I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.